Good morning. Who's glad they're in church this morning? Amen. We've had an incredible morning so far. And I just wanted to greet you from Pastors Chuck and Karen. As Pastor Carlos said, they're away at the gathering with Bishop, um, Pastor Bishop Tony Miller and Pastor Kathy. And so we're just happy that they're, they're getting time away to spend time with their friends. And that's always important. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to be staying in the same vein that Pastor's been preaching on. How many of you know have enjoyed his series so far? Everyone needs a place. Amen. Say everyone needs a place. Everyone needs a place. So today I'm going to be staying in that same vein, but I wanted to put a different twist on it. So everyone needs a place, and I tagged it as you are stronger than the struggle. I want you to look at five people around you and say, you're stronger than the struggle. Look at a few more people and say, your identity is not your struggle. You are stronger than your struggle. Because I was, I was just studying and praying for this service, and just some, I ran across some statistics, and I want to share those with you. If you guys could put those up on the screen. I came across these statistics on depression, anxiety, and suicide among church-going Christians. Now, it's the same across the board, church-going, non-church-going, believer, non-believer. And I thought these were so startling. So the first one is one in five American adults have experienced a mental health issue such as anxiety or depression or intrusive thoughts. One in five. One in 10 young people have experienced a period of major depression. One in 10 teenagers battle depression in our society today. One in 25 Americans have lived with a serious mental illness such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression. And suicide is now the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. It accounts for the loss of more than 41,000 American lives each year, more than double the number of lives lost to homicide. I was reading these statistics, and I know Pastor has been in the, the series of Everyone Needs a Place, and I just began to ask the Holy Spirit, I said, God, what is the problem? Why is suicide on the rise in our world, not just in our world, in the church? Why is anxiety on the rise in our world, not just in the world, in the church? Why are we more depressed than we ever have been? Why are we more medicated than we ever have been? Why? What's the answer? And I feel like these are questions the church has to address. And so I begin to say, God, what is it? What is going on in our nation? What is going on in our society? And I felt like he said to me so strongly, we are witnessing a generation of people who do not have a strong foundation. We are witnessing a generation that has been raised up in the church that are Christians by name only, that are believers by name only, and we do not have a foundation with our Father. We do not have a foundation of truth. And so we have become people who are tore, tore down, like Pastor Mark was saying in transition, when winds come, we don't know what to do. When storms of life come and they come, we don't know what to do. And now anxiety is on the rise. Now fear is on the rise. Now suicide is on the rise. Now depression is on the rise because we are witnessing a generation of believers who don't know what to do. So I want to look at this verse. If you guys can throw up Matthew 7, verse 24. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Next verse. It says that when the winds came, when the rain fell, when the floods came, and when the winds blew on that house, it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. I want you to look at someone and say, everyone needs a place. See, we now have become a generation of believers who are Christian in name only. We evoke the name of God in tragedy. We evoke the name of God in tough seasons and low moments of our lives. And, but we don't have a foundation to stand on when we're in the middle of it. And so, yeah, depression is on the rise. Anxiety is on the rise because of this foundation issue. You see, now we have cracks in our foundation. 
Our foundation has become faulty. Our foundation is now crumbling in America, in the church. It's a foundation that is crumbling. And there's some things that have begun to trickle down through, that, through the cracks in the foundation. So I just want to show that to you real quick. Two things have trickled down through the cracks in our foundation. The first one is we believe in what God says, but we don't believe it enough to be moved by it. We believe in what God says, but we don't believe it enough to be moved by it. If tithing is a principle, if tithing is a value of the kingdom, if God has commanded us to give 10%, the first 10% of everything we earn, why are we not consistent tithers in the body of Christ? We believe it's right to tithe. No one disagrees. We, we know. We know. We say, God, you're right. It's right to tithe. But, but see, something came up this week, and I don't know if I'll have enough. So we begin to, to become Christians who have normalized our disobedience in the church. So we believe what God says. We just don't believe it enough to be moved by it. The second thing, I know I'm going fast, I got to get somewhere. The second thing that we believe, we believe in what God did, we just don't believe it enough to be transformed by it. We believe Jesus died on the cross. We believe he came and he took my sin. He was the atonement for what I deserved. We believe that, but are we believing it enough to be transformed by it? Is the only thing about your life different from before you got saved till now is what you go to on Sunday morning? Is the only thing different about you where you go on Sunday morning? Or has your life been so radically changed by an encounter with God? Has your life been so radically touched by the grace of God that stepped in and took your place by the mercy of God that took your place on the cross and said, I will take what they deserve? Has your life been so marked by your experience with God that you don't talk the same like you used to talk? You don't act the same that you used to act like. You don't get away with things that you used to get away with because conviction has set in. And you say, you know what? There's got to be more. I'm not trying to have a religious experience every Sunday morning that allows me to leave and remain the same way that I came in. I'm st I don't want to leave still broken when the church is here for restoration. I don't want to leave this place the same way that I came in, still addicted, still struggling, still dealing with the same issues I've been dealing with, dealing with anxiety, dealing with depression. When he said, I have come, I have come. We believe what God did on the cross. I'm afraid we just don't believe it enough to be transformed by it. See, we have bought into the lie, modern Christianity, that says, you know what? God is okay as long as I believe the right things. And he's okay as long as I'm against the right things. But I don't actually have to do the right things. It's a foundation issue. Okay, so can we throw that verse back up, uh, Matthew 7, 24? So here's what a lack of foundation has caused. So therefore, everyone who hears these words and puts them into practice, so therefore, everyone who hears what he says and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, on a solid foundation. Okay, and it says that, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, but the house did not fall. See, we have a generation growing up in church now that doesn't know what to do when the rains fall. They don't know what to do when the floods come. They don't know what to do when the winds come to destroy them. It's a generation that doesn't know what to do. Can we look at those statistics again? Can you throw those up there one more time? A lack of foundation has caused one in five American adults to experience mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, or intrusive thoughts in the church. 
one in 10 young people, teenagers, are experiencing major depression in our nation. Teenagers are waking up and they don't have the will to live. What is happening in our nation? One in 25 Americans live with a serious mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar, or major depression. And suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in our nation today. Because here's the thing about depression and anxiety and fear. It comes. It comes. We have, we have almost bought into this lie in the church that if you have fear, that you're not spiritual enough. If you have anxiety, you're not spiritual enough. That's not true. Did you know Elijah, the prophet of the Lord, experienced anxiety, experienced depression? Let me show you. Can you throw up 1 Kings 18? Now, I'm just going to summarize. I'm going to give you the story of this chapter, but if you want to follow along, it's 1 Kings 18. So what we have is Obadiah, the Bible says he's a good man. He's an honorable man. He's a servant of the Lord, and he's working for the evil king Ahab and Jezebel. And so what happens is Elijah, who's been in exile, he comes to, to Obadiah, and he says, hey, I want you to set up a meeting between me and Ahab. And at this time, you have to realize that Israel was in a severe drought. Okay, so Ahab, he comes up to, to Elijah and he says, oh, it's you, the troubler of Israel. And Elijah responds to Ahab. He says, I'm not the one who's troubling Israel. You're troubling Israel, you and your family, because you've been worshiping Baal. You've been worshiping other gods than the one true God. You're the one who's been troubling Israel. And so they begin on this dialogue. And, and so what happens is Elijah says, you know what? Here's what, I, here's what we're going to do. I want you to go gather the, the 450 prophets of Baal, and I want you to get the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table and take them all and bring them up to Mount Carmel. And we're going to determine for sure who is God. So a lot of us know the story. They go up to Mount Carmel, and they, they begin to build an altar. Elijah's building an altar. Um, the, the prophets of Baal are building an altar. They're slicing the bull. They're putting it on the, on the wood. And Elijah says, but do not light the wood. Because we're going to pray to our God, and whoever sends fire and lights up the altar, they are the true God. Okay? So you have, if you could just picture with me this scene. If you continue to read this dialogue, it says that the 850 prophets of Baal, they begin to dance around their altar, cutting themselves as was their custom. So you have all these people, they're dancing around an altar, they're cutting themselves. The Bible says they're screaming frantically, and they're, saying, they're, they're screaming for Baal to light up their, their altar, to light up their sacrifice with fire. And if you keep reading, I love this story. I, I love reading the Bible because sometimes we miss some of the stuff that's actually happening in there. And what happens in this story, Elijah begins to make fun. He begins to taunt the prophets of Baal. He's like, he's looking at them, and, and if you read it, he says, I'm the only prophet of the Lord left. Like, he is so confident. He's standing there against these 850 prophets of Baal, and he's like, I'm the only prophet of the Lord left. And he begins to taunt them. He says, maybe you should cry a little louder. Maybe you should, you should scream a little louder. I don't think they, they can't hear you. It's in your Bible. He then, he then starts saying, oh, maybe they're busy. Maybe they're preoccupied with, um, you know, answering other people's prayers. I don't know. And so he's making fun of these prophets, and they're dancing around, and they become more frantic, and they're cutting themselves, and they're, they're, they're screaming out to Baal, and he's like, oh, scream louder. Maybe they're sleeping. I love reading this story. So if you can just imagine this, and Elijah finally goes, he, he's like, I've had enough. Just stop. Just stop. It's my turn. So Elijah then, he, the, the Bible says that he begins to repair the altar of the Lord. And he gets this 12 stones of Jacob, and he begins to, to put the, the bull on it. And then he does something interesting. He takes four jugs of water, and he says, I want you guys to drench this altar with water. Now, I don't know much about fire, but I know whenever you soak wood, it's really hard to ignite. I don't know much, but I know that. <laughs> So he begins to drench the altar with water, and the Bible says that he builds a trench around the altar, and it was so wet from all the water they poured on it that literally the trench was filled with water as well. He did that because the, the only way it was going to happen was by God, right? 
So Elijah, he's like, okay, I've drenched the altar. You've all, you guys have all seen me do this. So now it's my turn. He steps forward and he says, God, let your name be known. If you're God, then send fire down. Fire filled the altar. It licked up the sacrifice. It licked up all the water. It even licked up the soil. <laughs> and so he witnesses this incredible, this incredible display of God's glory. It's incredible. He has what we in, we in church call a mountaintop experience. Okay? He is like, he's experiencing it. He is bold. He is confident. I mean, how confident is Elijah to sit there and make fun of 850 prophets of Baal? He's one man, and he's making fun of them. And then he pours water all over the altar. He is confident, and he is bold in what he knows God is about to do. So we know the story. The fire falls down from heaven, and then he, he gathers all the, he tells the Israelites to gather all the, the prophets of Baal, the 850, and he brings them down to Kishon Valley, and they're slaughtered. They're killed. Okay, so he is having what we call a mountaintop experience. Now, I want you to look at this next verse, this next chapter. Can you put up 1 Kings 19? So what happens now, Ahab, he runs back to Jezebel, and he says, hey, Elijah just slaughtered all your prophets of Baal. They're dead. And she became angry, and she issued a threat to Elijah. And here's what she said. She said, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. So she says, here's what's going to happen, Elijah. May the gods deal with me like you dealed with the prophets of Baal if I don't kill you and take your life. And this next verse stood, stood out to me. Elijah was afraid. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant, and he went into the wilderness. He sat down under a bush, and he prayed that he might die. This is Elijah speaking to the Lord. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. This is Elijah. This is Elijah who just made fun of 850 prophets of Baal, called down fire from heaven. This is Elijah who was just experiencing an incredible victory on the mountaintop. What happened? Now he's in a valley, and all of a sudden fear sets in. And he says, God, take my life. Take my life, God. The second thing he says is, I am no better than my ancestors. So I just want to look at that verse. The take my life. You know, Elijah, he was essentially running from death to death. He was running from the death threat of Jezebel, and he was running to God and saying, I want to die. Take my life. He was running from death to death. Isn't it just like the enemy to make you feel like you are running from death to death? Isn't it just like the enemy to magnify your disappointments, to magnify your failures, to magnify the fear that is surrounding you? Isn't it just like the enemy to make you feel like you are in a death cycle? The enemy of your life wants nothing more for than you to feel like you are living from battle to battle, from defeat to defeat. He wants nothing more than for you to forget that he called you an overcomer. He wants you to forget that he said you were the head and not the tail. He wants you to forget that he said in Christ, you are victorious. So what does the enemy do? He, he magnifies our failures. He puts them on a slideshow in front of us, and he says, look at what you've done. You have failed. Look at the disappointments of your life. How are you ever going to come back from that? Look at this situation. How are you ever going to come back from that? The enemy wants you to feel like you are in a death cycle. When Christ has said we are in a perpetual hope cycle. We have a cycle of hope in Jesus, and that hope never stops, it never ends, it keeps going, it keeps running, even when you're in failure, even when you're disappointed, even when you're like Elijah and you witness a 24-hour difference from a mountaintop to a valley, his hope is still there. 
The second thing Elijah did, said in that, in that verse, he said, I am no better than my ancestors. If you research that, he was, ba- he was essentially saying, I am not built to outlast this pressure like my forefathers before me. Elijah, it's just, it blows my mind how, how even the saints have gone through this. He's like, I'm not built for this, God. I'm not built for this pressure. And that's why everybody needs a place. Because when you have a place, you have a community of believers who can put their arm around you and say, you know what? You are going to overcome this. You're going to make it. You're going to be in that perpetual cycle of hope. Don't let the enemy deceive you this morning. You are not in a cycle of death. You're in a cycle of hope. You're in a cycle of hope. And you are built to outlast the pressures of life. When you have your foundation built on Christ Jesus, whenever you know who you are in him, you can outlast the pressures of life. So the tactics that that the enemy was using in Elijah's day, it's the same thing he's using today. The same exact thing. I'm going to go through this. So the enemy wants to make you feel like you're in a death cycle and you're without hope. And you know why that's, that struck me? It's because life is full of mountains and valleys. Amen? Life is full of mountains and valleys. And it's so important to learn how to celebrate the victory on the mountaintop. But it is equally as important to know how to filter your your disappointment in the valley so you will not be disappointed. We have to know how to celebrate the victories of life. But you better know how to filter your your disappointment when you're in the valley and you don't know what to do. I don't filter my disappointment through myself. I filter my disappointment through God is good and God is love. God is good all the time. I may be disappointed, but he's good. I may be frustrated, but he's good. I may be tired, but he's good. I may be anxious, but he is good. What is your filter today? How are you filtering life's tough seasons? How are you filtering your disappointment? How are you filtering it? What will you do when you were just on the mountaintop and 24 hours later you're in the valley? Who are you going to call when you're in that place? What are you going to profess when you're in that place? What will you do? Another example of this is King David in the Bible. I love reading King David's Psalms. You know why? Because he's honest. I think sometimes we come to God with this illusion and we're like, God, I'm okay. I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good today. <laughs> All the while, we're struggling. <laughs> and God's like, I know. I know the innermost thoughts. I know what's going on in your heart. Listen, honesty always produces intimacy. If you want to be intimate with the Father, it's time to approach him with some honesty and say, you know what? I'm dealing with this, God. I don't understand this, God. This isn't fair, God. God wants your honesty. Because it produces intimacy. I think we think we're not, we're not religious or spiritual enough if we approach God like that. Like, oh, I can't, I can't tell God I'm struggling today. I'm supposed to be further along down the road. I can't tell God I'm dealing with anxiety. I'm supposed to be further down the road. And God is saying, I want your honesty. Because that is where intimacy is birthed. So let's look at this verse, Psalm 61.2. And we've heard this, this verse in church. It says, from the ends of the earth, I cry to you for help when my heart is overwhelmed. Not if, when. Lead me to the towering rock of safety. Another version that we quote a lot. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You know, King David wrote this when he was on the run. Theologians aren't sure if it was on the run from Saul or Absalom, but he was on the run. And he found himself in a distant place. Whenever you see that distant place, foreign land, he was away from the tabernacle. He was away from God's presence. And he was saying, God, I feel like I'm so far from your presence. And my heart is overwhelmed. 
life has gotten difficult and my heart is overwhelmed. And notice, notice that he says, lead me, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Because this is the thing about anxiety. It comes. It came for David. His heart was overwhelmed. But what did he do? He said, lead me to you, God. Take me from this place. I'm not going to stay here. I realize that this is the reality, but I'm walking toward the rock that is higher than I. I don't have to stay here. Anxiety is not your identity. Depression is not your identity. Struggle is not your identity. It is not your identity today. So David said, God, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Why do we have a culture that is so anxious? Why do we have a culture that is dealing with depression and fear? I think it's largely because we become a, a comparison culture. We spend more time taking our low places in life and comparing them with everyone else's high places. And we're saying, you know what, God, I'm discontent. It leads to discontentment every time. God is saying, do not stop and compare yourself with everybody else because you're on a journey and I'm taking you somewhere if you will let me. You don't have to stay in anxiety. So we know the problem. The problem is we become a generation without a foundation. We believe the right things. We say the right things but we don't think we actually have to do the right things. So here's three ways to combat the enemy's tactics. I want to give you three ways. The first way is you need to realize that your prayers are powerful. Your prayers are so powerful. Prayer is our most, it is one of the tools, the greatest tools that God has given us, but it is the least utilized. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is not the thing I do whenever everything in my life is falling apart. Prayer is not what I do whenever I think there's no other answer. We are not called to have prayer as our last resort. Prayer is our first response. Prayer is our first response to the struggles of life. Prayer is our first response, not our last resort. What do you do, King David, when anxiety comes? You pray. Because it is possible to begin in despair and end in peace. It is possible to begin in pain and end in peace. It is possible to begin in anxiety and end in peace. When you pray, your prayers are powerful. I want to look at this verse, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. We know this verse, we quote it. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in some situations. No, in every situation, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, submit your request to God. Right? And what does it say will happen? It says, then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your mind and your heart in Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, truth is not relative. Truth is not situational. Truth is absolute, and it is fixed in the person of Jesus. So he says, when you pray, when you pray, you can end in peace, and that peace will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It will guard your heart and your mind in truth. Why is that so important in truth? Because we are a confused generation. We are a confused generation. We're confused about our purpose. We're confused about our identity. We're confused about who we are and what we're supposed to do. And we are needing God. We are needing our identities found in him more than ever. More than ever. So whenever you pray, he says, I will guard peace, will guard your heart and your mind. Do you know the mind is a powerful thing? 
I love studying about the mind. One of the people I love to research is Dr. Caroline Leaf. If you've never researched her, she's a great um, source to pull from for the mind. I want to give you some things on the mind. You see, our minds, they perceive suppressed emotions as fear. Did you know that? If there are emotions that you're dealing with in life and you keep them suppressed, your mind says they're in fear. And fear, it's been scientifically proven, is the most toxic emotion that can go through your body. It affects you not only mentally, it affects you physically. Our, our mind, body, they're all connected. And so it's important what you think about. That's why the Bible says that we are called to have a sound mind. You know, I used to think about this verse, and we quote it all the time, but take every thought captive. Take every thought captive. I used to think, I was like, how do we do that? How do we take, do you know how many thoughts we think in a second? I'm like, how do I, how do I take every single thought captive? And Dr. Caroline Leaf explained it. She said, did you know that your thoughts are not abstract? Your thoughts are physical. Your thoughts look like a tree in your brain. They're physical. And so whenever you have a negative thought, whenever you have a positive thought, your thoughts are literally grow growing in your mind. They're not abstract. They are physical things. So when he says to take every thought captive, do you know why that's important? Because whenever you have feelings and thoughts of anxiety, anxiety is like a weed. Anxiety grows in your mind, and it crowds every single emotion out so that there's only anxiety left. Have you ever experienced that? I know I have. When you're in fear about something, and, and then your mind just goes to a thousand other things that could happen, that's anxiety growing in your mind. And it crowds out everything else, so nothing else can grow but that. Your mind is powerful. Your thoughts are powerful. So that leads me to our second thought, our second point. If you want to combat the enemy in your life, your thoughts are powerful. We have to learn how to take control of our thoughts. I love this verse, Lamentations 3.22. We sing it, we, we quote it, we say, God, his mercies are new every morning. They're new every morning. Did you know that that's not just a promise that sounds good? That is a physical promise. We have something in our brain called neurogenesis that happens every morning. Neurogenesis. So every single morning, Genesis, our brain creates new nerve cells that aid in the, in the tearing down of negative thoughts. So when God says that my mercies are new every morning, it is a physical promise for you to grab hold to. When God says that you can have control over your mind, when he says you have the mind of Christ, it is a physical promise, and he has given you the tools to do it. Our brain not only has neurogenesis, it has neuroplasticity, which means that it changes every day in response to our thinking. If you ever wondered where someone is at in life, and you're like, how did they get there? It started with their thought because there is no thought that is harmless. Your thought is either building positive things in your life or it's creating negative chaos in your life. That will be experienced ultimately in your body. Our prayers are powerful. Our thoughts are powerful. If you want to identify where you're at in life, identify your vocabulary. We need to learn how to step back and say, God, what just came out of my mouth? Why am I saying that? You're saying that because first you thought it, because you can't say anything without thinking it first. So as a man thinketh, so is he. So if you wonder where you're at in life, identify your vocabulary. If you wonder why you're struggling, look at your words. If you wonder why you feel alone and isolated and far from God, look at your words. What are they producing in your life? It's your thoughts. You know, emotions, emotions are made by our thought life. Emotions, here's the thing about emotions. We've heard it. They change. <laughs> I'm a woman. I know that's true. 
emotions change. Elijah was on the mountaintop declaring he was the only one of the Lord's prophets left. He was bold and he was courageous. And then he comes into the valley 24 hours later and he wants to die. Your emotions will change. My favorite quote of all time is by Joyce Meyer. She says, you are not what you feel. You are what you believe. And if you are steadfast, if you continue to walk in that belief, those feelings will catch up. You know, the enemy knows he does not have power, only the power that you give him. So why do we give him our mind? Why do we give the enemy free reign over our mind? Why do we say any thought can come and stay? Why do we do that? You have to guard. That takes action. I guard my thoughts and my mind. The third thing, the third thing I wanted to to talk to you about for a tactic in combating the enemy. So you have to realize that your purpose is powerful. Your purpose is powerful. Pastor Porter, if you could go ahead and come up. We're running out of time. Your purpose is powerful. There's a story I want to end with by the name of, of Victor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl, he was a man, he was a a psychologist in Germany, in Nazi Germany, and he was a Jewish, he was a Jewish man. He he wrote the book, uh, Man's Meaning for Life. And his his studies, his work, his branch of psychology called logotherapy, it came out of this experience in the Nazi camps. And so Viktor Frankl, he was a man that lost his wife, he lost both of his parents in Auschwitz. They were murdered. So all around him, Viktor Frankl saw nothing but death and destruction. He saw nothing but hardship. He saw nothing but pain. And it was incredible because Viktor Frankl, he tied purpose to enduring. He said, you know what? If you have purpose, if you know your purpose in life, he said those people in Auschwitz were more apt to endure the hardships of the moment. He connected purpose to our ability to persevere. Viktor Frankl, he argued that purpose is the most powerful motivator. And he made this statement. He said, when I can no longer change my situation, I change myself. Viktor Frankl, he was in the middle of a Nazi Germany camp, Auschwitz. The worst of the worst, his father died, his mother was killed, his wife was killed. All he saw was death and destruction. And he said, you know what, if I can no longer change my scenery of life, I change myself. Because your purpose is powerful. What has God called you to do? Every single one of you in here has a purpose. Every single one of you in here, God wants to use mightily but we live in fear, we live in anxiety, we live in a death cycle, and we feel like we're going from death to death. We feel like we're we're Elijah, where in 24 hours everything was good and then everything was bad. Sometimes it can be overwhelming, King David, (laughs) to feel like you're isolated and alone. It can feel so overwhelming, but that is why everyone needs a place. Everyone needs a place. Who do you have in your place? This is your place. Who is in this place that you can call and say, you know what, I'm going through a valley and the shadow of death feels so real. I feel like it's on my back and I don't know what to do. What will you do when anxiety comes? Because it comes. What will you do when fear comes? Because it comes. Sometimes we say, well, we just got to faith it out. And I believe that there's got to be faith. But God gives you a community of believers to walk with you and put their arm around you and say, you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. 
so often, and that is the mentality of the American church today, independence. I've got it, God. I will call on you when everything is falling apart. Until then, I've got it. And we've become so dependent on ourselves and not on God. And it's no wonder why we are living in fear and anxiety. It's no wonder why there are seasons of depression that comes and we feel like we're living in a death cycle. We feel like the valley of the shadow of death is on us. And I felt like the, when the Lord laid this on my heart, I was like, God, I feel like it's such a heavy, a heavy thing. You know, we don't talk about it much in church. We don't talk about anxiety and suicide and depression much in church. And the very thing we're not vocal about is what we need to be loud about. You need to be loud about the fact that there is hope. We have to be loud about the fact that Jesus died to make you whole. You don't have to live in anxiety and fear. Depression is not your identity. You are stronger than every struggle that you face in life. You will make it. You will overcome. Death is not your story. Stop letting the enemy convince you that the final verdict over your life is death. Because it's hope. There is hope in Jesus. You can all go ahead and stand. We're closing. I just wanted to leave today with you knowing that there is a hope cycle in your life. And God wants you to get in it. He says, get in my hope cycle. Because it never ends. It never stops. There's always hope over your life. And I feel like some of you are in here today and you deal with anxiety. You deal with fear. You deal with depression. You deal with thoughts of ending your life when things get hard. And we are a community of believers. These things are not to hide in the corner and say, God, I just need you to heal me. He will, but he gives you people in your life to fight and pray with you. Stop letting the enemy convince you that you have to be isolated in it. That is not the message of Jesus. That is not the message of hope. And if you're in this place this morning and you've been struggling, I believe that's why we witnessed such an incredible atmosphere of worship today, of an open heaven, because God wants to come and he wants to love on you today. He wants you to experience him as a father. Some of us have a missed have, we have a, a warped idea of what a father is. Let me tell you what a father is. A father is one who will lay his life down for his children. A father is one that wraps his arms around you when you're going through the toughest seasons of your life. Before God is your judge, he's your father. Before God is anything else, he's your father. And some of us have such a hard time with that because we didn't have the earthly example that we were supposed to have, that we were meant to have. All of these things, they have have equated mental illness to fatherless homes. People who come out of fatherless homes are more apt to deal with these things. Why? Because God gave us fathers because he is a father. And he wants you to know today that you may not have had a good example but he wants to shower you with his love. You don't have to walk out of here in the same fear you came in with. God has got you, he's got your family, he's got your life in the palm of his hands. He feeds the birds, why would he not feed me? My sons never ask me in the morning, are we going to eat today? They may ask me, what are we going to eat or when? But they never ask me, are we going to eat today? That's because that's why God calls us to have the faith like a child, to trust him like a child. 
because my children don't have a problem trusting that I'm going to take care of them. And he wants you to leave this morning knowing that there is a perpetual cycle of hope over your life and that he has got you. He has got you. If you're dealing with this today, I just want the worship team to go back into a time of, of worship. We're gonna, we wanna pray over you. This is what the community of churches, believers is for. Do not leave this place if you're struggling today. Nothing is more important than leaving here whole. Everything else can wait. He's issuing to you today a call. He says, just come, just come. Honesty produces intimacy. If you want intimacy with the Father, it's going to take honesty. So if that's you today, the altars are open. We want to pray over you. So for the next few seconds, make your way up to the altar if that's you. And we just want to pray over you. So I
I'm going to ask all the men, if you are a man and you're in the house, young boys, older gentlemen, I want you to come up to the front. All the men. And I, I want to clarify this. It's not that we are doing anything separate for the women. But as a man, there are certain struggles that we go through. And as men, we're taught to be strong and tough. And we're, we're, we're taught to... You just got to get through it. And, and and I know I've been struggling a lot with that because I have conversations with my wife all the time. I say, babe, I, I, I got friends, but I'm lonely. I got you, but I'm lonely. Why do I feel so lonely? Why do I feel I have nobody to talk to? And I have friends that are in my life that will call me, and but it's not the same. And we're just taught that as a man, you're supposed to just have it together. You're supposed to get through it. You're supposed to be a husband. You're supposed to be a father. You're supposed to make sure that money comes in. You're supposed to make sure that bills are paid. And nobody realizes the pressure of being a man. It is pressure being a man. How do I teach my son how to be a man? How do I, how, how do I teach my daughter what man to look for? Who do I turn to? And sometimes we pray and we don't hear anything. And we're taught as men, and my dad will tell me all the time when I do reach out to him from time to time, hey, Pop, dude, suck it up. Be a man. He don't really give me anything, but suck it up. Be a man. I've heard that all my life. Suck it up. Be a man. If the bills don't get paid, it's your fault. If the children ain't right, it's your fault. If your wife ain't right, it's your fault. But guess what? Everything is my fault. So how do I get through it? I lay beside my wife in bed at night and we talk and she's like, baby, what's wrong? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Truth is, I don't want to call brother so-and-so because I don't want to burden him. He's going through his own stuff. I don't want to call so-and-so because guess what? They just called me and I had to pray for them. But after I pray for them, who pours back into me? Who pours back into me? I get calls all the time. I get texts all the time. And, 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 you know, it makes me feel good to be there for somebody else. 
but then there's times where I need somebody to be there for me. And the truth is because you're Jeremy or because you're minister so-and-so or because you're, 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 you're big brother to somebody, you can't turn to that little brother that's dependent on you and say, hey, bro, I'm struggling too. See, so I need some help. See, so I need some prayer. And you see, I struggle with, you know, when you, when you put your feelings out there and you put your emotions out there and you say to somebody that you need help because you're struggling, they automatically think, well, is it his marriage? Is it his children? You know, I ain't struggling with nothing like that. I'm not struggling with that. My wife is good. Well, our relationship is good. I'm struggling with just responsibilities and, and making decisions and, and what's the next step and how does my family get to the next level and how do I get to the next level? And, and you know what the truth is? God, you're showing me these big things you want me to do. How do I get there? Am I ready for that responsibility? What do I do? And these are the things as men that we don't talk about because it shows weakness. And you know, I'm going to tell you, I ain't no punk. I ain't no punk. I'm not no punk Christian. I'm a strong man. You know what I mean? So it ain't about being scared. It's about not wanting to make the wrong step because I got a lot of people dependent on me. If I make a bad choice, my whole family goes down. My wife gets looked at crazy, and I'm not going to let that happen. So for some reason, I just really feel that I need to pray a special prayer over the men in here today. Because the truth is, if each and every one of y'all were to be real, y'all are going through exactly what I'm going through. Y'all feel what I'm talking about feeling right now. But nobody wants to say anything. And we quietly struggle. And we go through day by day. Let me tell you something, man. You preached a heck of a word today. You preached a heck of a word today. Because if I told you half of the battles that I go through in my mind, and I'm a Christian, I love God, I believe in God, I live for God, and I struggle. And that's real. One thing everybody who knows me, I'm a straight shot. I'm not going to sugarcoat nothing. It's black or white with me. Either I'm going to go all in, or I ain't going at all. And one thing about me, I, 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 I ain't no punk Christian, man. I'm not scared. I just don't want to make a mistake. I don't want God to be ashamed. I don't want to let people down that depend on me. But sometimes in not wanting to let them down and, and feeling the responsibility, I'm reluctant to move. And the more that you're reluctant to move, the longer you stay still. And the longer you stay still, the stiffer you get. And the stiffer you get, the more it hurts when it's time to move. And then you opt not to move. And when you opt not to move, now you're not doing what God has called you to. So I want every man in here to lock hands with the man next to him. Because truth is, is this. The women do a heck of a job in the church. They are the ones praying for each and every one of us. And truth is, we couldn't be where we are if it wasn't for them. I fuss at my wife all the time. Stop nagging me. But the things she's nagging me about are the things that if I'm truthful, I need to do. You're gifted. Why don't you do this? And why are you not doing this? Shut up, woman. Leave me alone. But then when I go on my quiet place and I pray, the Lord said, she's right. She's right. I had a brother, while we were in church, text me while I was sitting in church and said, Brother Jeremy, I'm struggling. I need you. And I said, God, he needs me, but I need somebody else too. Because what you don't seem to realize is the more you get closer to your purpose, the lonelier you feel. Because you can't attach yourself to everything. You can't do any old thing. The Bible says much known is much required. And if you're faithful over a few things, he makes you ruler over many. A lot of us want the many, but we don't realize to get the many, it hurts. It's hard. It's frustrating. So I want to pray a special prayer. I want all the women to stretch forth your hands. 
to all the men in the house. It's because the truth is, if we ever were to really share our hearts with you, you would really realize how burdened down as men we really are. Dear Heavenly Father God, God, we need you. We need you more than ever before. It's hard being a man in this society, let alone being a believer, because once you put it out there in the atmosphere that you're a believer, you're set higher than the regular man because people expect you to have it together. People expect you to have all the answers. And if you ever take a wrong step, the judgment that we face is like none other. So God, right now, we need you to equip each and every man in here this morning to be prepared to go out in society and live for you. But God, we also need you to give us the strategy and the direction and, and, and connect us with somebody that is gonna uplift us. God, spark in somebody's spirit to pray for us, spark in somebody's spirit to speak over us. Because God, we're at a point right now that for us to experience what Pastor Mark spoke about in transition, we have to be prepared for it. For the next level of anointing, for the next level of assignment, for the next level to get in you, we have to be to the point where we need to be prepared because we have to be as men in the place to really help the younger men. God, give us strategies to be better husbands. Give us strategies to be better fathers. Give us strategies to be better mentors. Give us strategies to be better businessmen and, 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 and employees and employers. Because God, that's what it's all about. It's not about what we do here in the church. It's about what we do out there amongst the world where people are looking at us. And people, not only are they looking at us, they're waiting for us to make a mistake. But God, we ask right now that you give us strategy. Help us to be as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove. Help us to lean to you so we can go forth and make you proud. Embrace us with your presence. And let us know that it's okay. Help us to let our pride fall and open up our hearts to you. And it's okay if we don't have the answers because we realize today that prayer is what we do first, not what we do last. And God, we ask that you take this prayer from our hearts and touch each and every man in this house. And whatever it is that they're going through in their hearts, whatever it is they're quietly struggling with, whatever it is they're openly struggling with, whatever thought is, is, is just wrecking their brain, we ask right now that you give them peace that surpasses all understanding. People will look to us and say, why in the world are you so calm? Hey, only if you knew, buddy. It's God. And we glorify you. We give you praise in advance for the testimonies. We give you praise in advance for the shift. We give you praise in advance for the elevation. And we give you glory in advance right now because all is well. Peace be still. And we're going to let you fight our battles. In Jesus' name, amen. I think if you're standing next, we're going to end out. So if everyone could just grab the hand of someone next to you, we're going to end out in prayer. I just want everyone touching someone. Everyone touch someone. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, you're not alone. You're not alone. Because you know the thing about, about that, that promise of peace. He says he gives peace that surpasses all understanding. So that means that even when times in my life things don't make sense, what he does is he gives us peace that doesn't make sense. He promises peace that doesn't make sense. And I feel like today, as we all are touching someone, that we all need a reminder at times that we're on a journey together. And not only does God have us, we have each other. And we commit to praying for each other. We commit to checking on each other. We commit to asking the question, are you okay? I'm with you. 
we're going to do this together. So let's just end in prayer. I want everyone in this room praying. Say, Father God, we just thank you this morning. We lift up our voice in prayer. Let's let a roar of prayer arise. Let's pray. Open up your mouth and pray. Say, God, I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in my life. I thank you, Lord, for your promise of wholeness in my life. I thank you, Lord, that you give peace when everything doesn't make sense. You answer with peace that doesn't make sense. God, I thank you that you are as close as the mention of your name. You have promised that we can have a sound mind. You have promised that there is a hope cycle for our life. And so we thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are our Father first who loves us and who is there for us, who is there always for us. And we thank you, God. We praise you for that this morning. We praise you, God, for you are good. You are always, always good. We declare your faithfulness over this place today. We acknowledge your goodness today, God. We put it on display in front of us, Lord, because you're good and you're worthy this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want you to give someone a hug next to you. We're a community. This is what church is about. We're a community. Pastor Chuck and Karen will be back next week, and I know pastor's got a word for this house and, and season word. So we love you guys. We thank you. We bless you. We'll see you next week.